Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. For those in-house, we do ask that last courtesy check that our mobile devices have been silenced or turned off. And of course, those watching online are welcome to send questions or comments at any time, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. And we, of course, post the program following today's event for everyone's future reference on the Heritage website. Leading our discussion and welcoming our guest is Paul Larkin. Mr. Larkin is our John, Barbara, and Victoria Rumpel Senior Legal Research Fellow in the Edwin Meese Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. He directs our over-criminalization project, Counter the Abuse of Criminal Law, particularly at the federal level. From 1984 to 93, he served at the Department of Justice as an assistant to the Solicitor General and as an attorney in the Criminal Division. He also has argued 27 cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. He then served as counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee and head of the crime unit for Senator Orrin Hatch, then the panel's chairman. He has also served at the EPA as well as in two major Washington, D.C. law firms. Please join me in welcoming Paul Larkin. Paul? Thank you, John, and thank you to all of you for coming particularly on such a, an unfavorable weather day. We appreciate the opportunity uh, to tell you about a book. This is, after all, a book event. Professor Joseph Postel is the author of Bureaucracy in America, The Administrative State and American Constitutionalism. And there are copies outside if you would like to buy some after the event. In the opening sentence of his book, Professor Postel audaciously declares that the development of the administrative state since the beginning of the 20th century is the most important development in America's constitutional Republican form of government since the framers met in Philadelphia in 1787. The professor then goes on to prove why his assertion is correct. In the process, he educates the reader whether that reader is a rookie or a veteran of numerous battles with the administrative state, why everyone should be concerned about how far we have strayed from the allocation of federal government authority set forth in our nation's charter. In Professor Postel's view, there has always been a tension between administrative power and American constitutionalism. Much as the ego regulates the contest between the id and the superego, administrative law governs the tension between the administrative state and the rule of law. Yet although bureaucracy in America focuses specifically on the constitutional and legal status of administrative power, Bureaucracy in America is not a treatise on administrative law along the lines of the ones written by professors such as Kenneth Culp Davis. Instead, bureaucracy in America explains the maturation of 20th century administrative law by describing the political and constitutional philosophies of progressives, New Dealers, liberals, and conservatives as each one in turn sought to create control, promote, or retard the historical growth of the Leviathan. Professor Postel achieves that result by using, as he puts it, quote, an integrative approach, unquote. He canvasses the historical background to and the philosophical underpinnings of the administrative state that exists today. He also describes the Sherman through Georgia-like march that we have witnessed as today's administrative state has grown from a small bureaucracy that delivered the mail and administered federal pensions toward a behemoth that can require a license to cut someone's hair and can tell local schools throughout the nation what bathrooms its students must be permitted to use. I have read Bureaucracy in America and it is a terrific Terrific book. Anyone interested in the administrative state, administrative law, regulation, bureaucracy, or the separation of powers should read it. 
it is sure to become a classic reference on the subjects identified in its title. And I am very thankful he's willing to share time with us today to talk about his book. Now, let me tell you a few words about our guest author, Professor Joseph Postel. He is an associate professor of political science at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. He teaches courses on American political institutions, American political thought, and administrative law. Professor Postel has also been the visiting fellow in American political thought with the Simon Center at the Heritage Foundation throughout the 2017 to 2018 academic year, and we are fortunate to have him. His research focuses on regulation, administrative law, and the administrative state. He is the editor of two other books, Rediscovering Political Economy with Bradley Watson and Toward an American Conservatism with Jonathan O'Neill. He is also a frequent contributor to the Liberty Fund's Liberty, excuse me, Library of Law and Liberty. It's a website on political thought. Without further ado, let me turn the stage over to our guest, Professor Joseph Postel. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thank you, Paul, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'd also like to thank David Azarad, my current boss at Heritage, uh, for all of his support for this project over the years. And especially, I want to thank all of you for coming today, for being here. So Bureaucracy in America uh, is a book about the history of administration and the administrative state from about 1750 to 2015. As you can imagine, I'm not going to try to summarize the book in 30 minutes today. Um, what I would like to do instead is to provide some sense of the fascinating historical twists and turns that uh, the history of bureaucracy has taken in this country. Now, again, it's the history of bureaucracy in America. You might not think that it's a page turner or that this is rip-roaring history, but there are actually some really fascinating and instructive surprises in this story. Um, but also, in touching on the, some of the highlights of this history, I want to focus on three major contributions that I hope the book can make to the way we think about the administrative state today. Uh, the first has to do with this, uh, the historical status of this new term that is increasingly used to describe some people, uh, anti-administrativism. Um, that is a term that's used pejoratively, but I don't think it should be. Uh, the second um, theme I want to touch on has to do with the way in which administrative law has befuddled and confused conservatives over the last 50 to 60 years. Uh, and the last uh, third contribution I want to make today um, has to do with the alternative to the administrative state and what that looks like. Uh, next year, it will be 25 years since a law professor at Northwestern University named Gary Lawson published an article called The Rise and Rise of the Administrative State in the Harvard Law Review. In the first sentence of that article, Lawson wrote this, the post-New Deal administrative state is unconstitutional, and its validation by the legal system amounts to nothing less than a constitutional revolution, end of quote. For the most part, Lawson's voice was a lone voice in the wilderness, and it remains so for over a decade. Fast forward nearly 25 years later, and things have changed dramatically. Instead of an isolated voice warning about the constitutional problems of the administrative state, we now have many voices in politics and in academia warning about the administrative state. Last November, the Harvard Law Review, the same journal which published Lawson's article 24 years ago, opened its Supreme Court review issue with an article titled, 1930s Redux, the Administrative State Under Siege. According to Jillian Metzger, the author of this article, there has been a resurgence of what she calls anti-administrativism. And the ranks of the anti-administrativists, in her words, are misdiagnosing the administrative state's constitutional status. I will keep using that term anti-administrativism and anti-administrativists. Um, in spite of the uh, context in which she uses it um, throughout this talk. Um, according to Metzger, 
anti-administrativists, and this is quoting her, uh, paint the administrative state as fundamentally at odds with the Constitution's separation of powers system, producing unaccountable and aggrandized power in the process, end of quote. These anti-administrativists, in other words, are dangerous people, notorious academics, notorious politicians who threaten to erode and destabilize the political system. The contrast between 1994 and 2018 is striking. Instead of the rise and rise of the administrative state, we now have the administrative state under siege. In just a short period, this subject has gone from being an obscure, arcane, academic subject to a central political controversy. As much as this represents progress, there is also a danger that we do not adequately understand the history and the development of the thing that many of us critique. Just as originalists study the history and the discussion around specific constitutional provisions, so they should also study the history and the discussion on the administrative state in order to form adequate opinions about it. Uh, and I think bureaucracy in America uh, presents a careful study of the history of bureaucracy that can inform these efforts. Um, what are some of the lessons of history we learn from uh, studying bureaucracy in America? Perhaps the most important lesson is this. Resistance to the administrative state is a central and a healthy feature of American constitutionalism. Resistance to the administrative state is not a radical, dangerous uh, thing to do. It's actually part of a healthy American constitutional culture. And historically, those who uh, spoke up about the administrative state in the past um, used the same language that many use today. The reality is that at every point in American history, when the administrative state was proposed, people stood up to voice familiar constitutional objections. One of the most rewarding experiences in um, researching the history of bureaucracy in America was finding forgotten critics of the administrative state, people who uh, were once prominent and who said, um, who spoke out against the administrative state, uh, but for some reason historians have forgotten them. These people throughout American history voiced their concerns in nearly the same language that we use today. In other words, there is a rich history, a rich tradition of constitutional resistance, even anti-administrativism, on which we can draw, and we can be confident in using that tradition that we're not fabricating objections out of thin air, but are continuing to stand up for well-established constitutional principles. I'll give you a few small samples of this. Uh, the debate over the Interstate Commerce Commission, which is normally understood, I think wrongly, to be the first major federal regulatory commission. This is uh, established in the 1880s. The debate over the Interstate Commerce Commission um, revealed many opponents of bureaucracy who succeeded in keeping the commission's power to be in a very limited sphere. The main character in this story, a fellow named John Reagan, not Ronald, but John Reagan, uh, argued forcefully against vesting massive power in this new commission. Here's what Reagan said on the floor of Congress. Quote, Americans are not accustomed to the administration of the civil law through bureau orders, end of quote. One of his allies, a fellow named Poindexter Dunn, um, creative and interesting names, uh, abound in, 19, in the 19th century Congress, uh, Poindexter Dunn put it more forcefully. Here is what he said. The correct principle in government was asserted when the courts were ordained and created to enforce rights and prohibit wrong. If we have come upon a time when any law that we enact declaring rights and prohibiting wrongs cannot be administered through the courts, then indeed we have reached the end of free government. End of quote. This was in the 1880s when the Interstate Commerce Commission was being proposed. John Reagan, Poindexter Dunn, and other uh, people we might call anti-administrativists of the 1880s actually succeeded in their task. The Interstate Commerce Commission, when it was first established, did not set up a new bureaucracy, did not create a massive regulatory uh, commission, 
but rather um, it was simply um, a small, weak, relatively weak body that allowed complainants to either choose between taking their cases to common law courts or to adjudicate cases with the commission. Uh, the Interstate Commerce Commission was not able to enforce its decisions, and it could only ask U.S. attorneys to file suit in federal district court for the enforcement of the ICC's uh, decisions. In other words, the ICC, when it was originally created, lacked power to take any final action when it was created, and it served largely as an initial fact finder. This is why one member of Congress said, when it was being created, that it was merely, quote, an ornamental board of as little use as the fifth wheel in a wagon, end of quote. Um, scholars seem to think that the ICC was sort of this new Rubicon that we crossed in the 1880s, and the reality is very different. Uh, take some other uh, examples um, from other periods in American history. Not all of the uh, resistors to the administrative state were conservatives. The real surprise, actually, when looking through this historical record was how many progressives were anti-administrativists. Uh, this is the really shocking story in uh, American history. There were many progressives who agreed with the ends of the administrative state but they were very critical of the means used to reach those ends. And probably the most surprising character here was Theodore Roosevelt's chief opponent in the 1912 presidential election, Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson in 1912 attacked the administrative state in terms that resemble those of Philip Hamburger in his great book, Is Administrative Law Unlawful? Let me give you two quotes from Wilson that again, do not sound like the Woodrow Wilson we've come to know from uh, contemporary stories about him. Here's a speech Wilson gave on Labor Day during the 1912 presidential election. Quote, what I fear is a government of experts. God forbid that in a democratic country, we should resign the task and give the government to experts, end of quote. That was Woodrow Wilson in 1912. Now, it might be tempting to dismiss Wilson's anti-administrativism as mere campaign rhetoric. But Wilson had actually been voicing these concerns for many years. Uh, in a 1908 speech, four years before the 1912 election, called Law or Personal Power, Woodrow Wilson said the following. The government of the United States was established to get rid of arbitrary, that is discretionary executive power. If we return to it, we abandon the very principles of our foundation, end of quote. Again, if I read that quote and told you that it came from somebody like Philip Hamburger, you would actually believe it, and yet it was Woodrow Wilson in 1908. So anti-administrativism is not only a long-standing tradition in American politics, it is a bipartisan tradition. Conservative and progressive anti-administrativists have spoken up throughout American history to resist the encroachment of the administrative state. In addition to Woodrow Wilson, uh, you could cite Louis Brandeis, Robert La Follette, and Roscoe Pound as other very prominent progressives who were skeptics of the administrative state. And this long-standing tradition of anti-administrativism has been good for the country. It's not dangerous, it's not disruptive. In fact, it has accomplished great good. It has hemmed in the administrative state it has taken off some of its harsh, harshest edges. Anti-administrativism is part of the story of the administrative state. It has shaped the trajectory of the administrative state. I'll give you one last example. Uh, and this comes towards the end of the New Deal in the 1940s. During the New Deal, especially as the 1930s came to a close, lawyers and judges in particular, the bench and the bar, uh, objected very strenuously to what they saw as the transfer of power from courts over to administrative tribunals. And Roscoe Pound, who may have been the most prominent legal theorist uh, and very progressive, um, most prominent legal theorist of his day, uh, sort of the leader of this legal resistance to the administrative state. Pound really believed that eventually all of this judicial power that was being transferred to uh, administrative tribunals would one day 
be rejudicialized, that, that the power to adjudicate would be transferred back into independent courts where specialist judges would be able to decide cases instead of what today we have with administrative law judges doing this. Um, administrative law would once again, he thought, become ordinary law exercised by bodies resembling common law courts. Specialized justices or, or judges composing what he thought, uh, he envisioned a bureau of justice would replace the regulatory functions of New Deal administrative agencies. Now, of course, this never happened, but not for lack of trying. The constitutional resistance here um, accomplished a great deal and very nearly changed the whole direction of the administrative state. Um, a little known bill today, it passed in 1939 called the Walter Logan Act, actually would have fundamentally changed the future direction of the administrative state. And people like Roscoe Pound were heavily involved in getting that bill passed. Unfortunately, Franklin Roosevelt's veto ensured that that would never become law. And in response, um, people who resisted the growth of the administrative state eventually adopted a weaker measure known as the Administrative Procedure Act, passed in 1946, and with which administrative lawyers are all too familiar. Um, in reading the legislative debates on the Administrative Procedure Act, three fascinating themes emerge. The first is that the discussion was littered with anti-administrativism. Here is a taste. And some of these um, statements on the floor of Congress um, are, are just really entertaining. Um, a fellow named John Jennings, representative from Tennessee, said this during the debate, quote, the chief indoor sport of the federal bureaucrat is to evolve out of his own inner consciousness, like a spider spins his web, countless confusing rules and regulations which may deprive a man of his property, his liberty, and bedevil the very life out of him." End of quote. Like spiders spin their webs, federal bureaucrats spin their rules and regulations. Others were slightly more restrained than Jennings. Uh, Dean Acheson, actually a very prominent political figure of this time, he was chair of the Attorney General's Committee on Administrative Procedure, and later President Truman's Secretary of State, uh, said this about the administrative state. Quote, there is someone called the commission the authority, a metaphysical, omniscient, brooding thing which sort of floats around the air and is not a human being. That is what perplexes people." <laughs> End of quote. Um, hardly a reactionary, hardly a, uh, a staunch originalist, Acheson nevertheless understood that at the very least citizens needed some protection from the threat of this brooding, mysterious, omniscient, uh, metaphysical authority, in his words. The second interesting thing about the APA debates um, is that the members of Congress who enacted it believe that it expanded judicial review significantly. And this really gets to many of the questions surrounding the Chevron doctrine today. Um, Senator Pat McCarran, who probably did more than anyone to uh, shepherd the Administrative Procedure Act to passage, was asked several times on the floor of Congress whether the Administrative Procedure Act expanded judicial review. Uh, and he said very clearly, um, Section 706 of this bill, uh, or, or section what became Section 706, um, expressly provides that courts shall decide all relevant questions of law. That the courts would decide all relevant questions of law. And he published an article after the APA was enacted saying, uh, and this is a quote from the article, this will cut down on the cult of discretion, end of quote, that grew out of the New Deal. This cult of discretion, they really believed the Administrative Procedure Act ended, um, or at least cut back on that cult of discretion. Uh, the third, and maybe the most interesting part of the Administrative Procedure Act debates is that all of the administrative skeptics or anti-administrativists who were involved in bringing the bill to passage believe that it was only the first step in a longer process of administrative reform. Repeatedly, over and over again, as the me measure proceeded to a vote, members of Congress said, this is our first step and we're going to follow up on this with more legislation that will push further. Um, the Administrative Procedure Act was not a controversial measure. It passed, um, I believe, unanimously by a voice vote. 
um, it was uncontroversial because it had been sort of stripped of all of the controversial stuff that would have caused more people to oppose it. But everybody on the sort of anti-administrative side, when the bill was passed, announced that they were going to introduce more legislation to press for further reforms. Um, one member of the House, a fellow named Earl Missioner, called the APA a pioneer effort. It was just the first stage in this larger process. It can be amplified as circumstances warrant, he said. One of his colleagues, a fellow named John Robison, agreed, quote, it is not as comprehensive as it should be. It certainly is a step in the right direction. And as time goes on, no doubt it will be perfected by appropriate amendments, end of quote. They all believed that after 1946, when the Administrative Procedure Act was passed, that the battle would continue, that there would be more APA-type legislation. A strange thing happened, though. The intentions of many of the APA's framers to continue the fight never materialized. In spite of the fact that so many of them understood it to be a first step, they sort of declared victory and went home. Um, and this marked really the end of the constitutional resistance. I think there's something very instructive in that, um, that, that historical path. Um, okay, so so much for the first uh, big point I want to make, which is that anti-administrativism is this great long tradition in American politics. Um, once 1946 uh, was done and the Administrative Procedure Act was law, a curious turning point for the administrative state was reached. Um, instead of further fights to constrain the bureaucracy, the battle shifted to administrative law over the last 50, 60, 70 years now to constrain the administrative state. All three branches of government responded to the administrative state by reforming themselves to gain control of it. First, take Congress. Uh, it's no coincidence that in 1946, the same year that the Administrative Procedure Act was passed, Congress also passed another piece of legislation, uh, historic legislation, that is the Legislative Reorganization Act. By streamlining its committees, strengthening those committees, and um, admonishing them to engage in oversight, Congress put itself in the ideal position to move past legislating and start engaging in much more oversight. Now, Congress was always going to be in the driver's seat when it came to controlling the administrative state. Congress has the power of the purse, and Congress has a lot more people to engage in oversight of the bureaucracy, as opposed to a single person, pres the president, uh, much more limited in capacity to manage the bureaucracy. But the president, in response to Congress's reorganization, did not just sit idly by and let Congress take control. Instead, presidents entered into this struggle for control of the bureaucracy with great eagerness. And the key figure here, again, um, not well understood today, was Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon, his objective was essentially to take on the bureaucracy and make it serve his agenda rather than the agenda of the Congress. In a really tremendous little book, um, uh, which is not that difficult to read, very short, called The Plot That Failed, Richard Nathan described this attempted coup or hostile takeover of the administrative state by Nixon. Uh, Nixon's first strategy was, I think, a normal strategy that many presidents would adopt, which is um, put your political appointees in the cabinet agencies and departments, and they'll follow your agenda. Uh, he thought he could direct the bureaucracy by appointing people to run it. Nixon very quickly realized the ineffectiveness of this kind of an approach. Once the political appointees took office, they became advocates for their departments, for their programs, rather than advocates for the president. Eventually, Nixon abandoned the idea of working through his cabinet appointments entirely. John Ehrlichman said this to the press about Nixon's cabinet secretaries. We only see them at the White House Christmas party, then they go off and marry the natives. Uh, marrying the natives was essentially being drawn into the, the agencies rather than doing what the president intended. So Nixon came up with a different strategy. 
create a counter bureaucracy within the White House to combat the existing bureaucracy. This counter bureaucracy would be Nixon's personal means of control. Nixon reorganized the Office of Management and Budget, now a very powerful tool of presidential control, expanded the executive office of the president, and looked to reach into the bureaucracy from outside, rather than um, using political appointees to direct it. Now today we recognize all these agencies, OMB, OIRA, and so on, as part of the president's now attempts to control the administrative state. So not only Congress, but also the presidency adapted to this new administrative state. Uh, this prompted a very strong reaction from progressives. Surprisingly, they abandoned the notion of independent, apolitical, scientific administration and turned to the courts as partners in the administrative process. This produced a revolution in administrative law in the 1970s that fundamentally changed the way the administrative state works. Um, in sort of four areas in particular, um, progressives reversed their understanding of the administrative state to provide for more judicial intervention and control. First, progressives pushed for expanding the due process clause uh, and its influence in the administrative state, um, forbidding agencies from depriving individuals of benefits without uh, due process of law. They dramatically expanded the procedural requirements for administrative uh, rulemaking. They also relaxed standing requirements so that people could sue administrative agencies to get their preferred outcomes uh, enacted. And then finally, they, they ratcheted up or increased judicial review of the substance of agency decisions, what many administrative law um, junkies know as the hard look doctrine or uh, what became eventually the whole world of Chevron deference versus uh, judicial review of administrative legal interpretations. All of these things put the courts now in much greater control of the bureaucracy. Uh, Judge David Bazelon of the DC Circuit Court of Appeals, the critical mover in all of these developments, described what was going on this way. <coughs> really interesting language. Uh, he said that this was, quote, a new era in the long and fruitful collaboration of administrative agencies and reviewing courts, a judicial administrative partnership, end of quote. And progressives, interestingly now, we're talking about the courts supervising the agencies. Um, one political scientist speculated that instead of iron triangles, uh, connecting the Congress, interest groups, and the bureaucracy, we now needed to talk about iron rectangles with the courts as a fourth point in this uh, power structure. Now, in response to the progressives' judicialization of the administrative state, conservatives opted for something very peculiar. In a shocking reversal of the old progressive era and New Deal institutional allegiances, Conservatives now move to defend the administrative state from judicial encroachment rather than talking about the need to bring the courts into the uh, administrative state or to have the courts govern it. The two most famous cases, and I probably don't need to talk much uh, about these with this audience, you're all very familiar with them. Uh, the two most famous cases though are colloquially, colloquially known as Vermont Yankee and Chevron. Uh, in Vermont Yankee, the court, in an opinion written by Justice Rehnquist, uh, chastised the DC Circuit for impermissibly expanding the procedural requirements of notice and comment rulemaking. And then in Chevron, um, although Scalia never did not write the opinion in Chevron, he was, wasn't on the court when it was issued, uh, he nevertheless argued very much for its expansion and for a very strong reading of the case so that courts would have to defer to administrative interpretations of law. Again, in this sort of curious new world, it, were, it was conservatives defending the bureaucracy from judicial interference and progressives protesting the evils of unfettered executive power. This um, attempted conservative counter-revolution ultimately failed for two reasons. First, Vermont Yankee and Chevron really have not brought back the older way of administrative law where procedures for rulemaking are minimal and judges defer to administrative interpretations of law. 
Um, when judges want to overturn agencies' legal interpretations, they find ample means to do so. And um, administrative rulemaking today is heavily proceduralized to the point where agencies have sort of stopped doing it in order to engage in much more, uh, much easier ways of making policy like guidance documents and other kinds of what are called regulatory dark matter. In other words, um, we still have a very heavily proceduralized and judicialized administrative state. The second reason though, and I think the deeper reason the conservative counter-revolution failed is this. Administrative law can't alleviate the deeper concerns raised by the administrative state. The administrative state's defenders routinely say that administrative law can uh, reconcile the tension between the Constitution and the administrative state. But the history of administrative law shows this reconciliation has not taken place. The attempt to use administrative law to advance that reconciliation is fraught with dangerous consequences. To put it bluntly, administrative law places conservatives in a catch-22. Do you want courts running the administrative state, or do you want agencies having discretion to make their own rules? Administrative law doesn't present us with a good choice from those two options. Therefore, it might be useful for winning short-term policy battles, but larger structural reforms are necessary to win constitutional victories. This is why we must continue to advance the legislative reforms that we were promised by the people who wrote uh, the Administrative Procedure Act over 70 years ago. Okay, now to my last large point. What is the alternative to this? Is there an alternative to this dilemma that the administrative state presents us with? Can you have regulation without bureaucracy? Many of the anti-administrativists of the last two centuries believed that the answer to those questions was, yes, there is an alternative to all of this. You can have regulation without a bureaucracy. To understand the alternative to the administrative state, we have to go back and look at 19th century history and figure out how they did things back then. The first thing to note about 19th century regulation was how much of it there was. We think of the 19th century as a sort of unregulated, laissez-faire um, country that we had back then, but the historical reality is far different. Uh, just to provide a few examples, if you wanted to sell goods, um, pork or lumber or fish, you had to have them inspected before you could sell them in most states. If you wanted to engage in occupations, you had to get a license. The use of property was regulated through nuisance uh, and tort laws, and municipal health regulations were everywhere to govern a wide variety of activities. There was a lot of regulation in the 19th century. So if there was so much regulation in the 19th century, how did Americans manage to avoid creating an administrative state? A clue to the answer is produced by uh, a famous phrase from a political scientist, Stephen Skoranek, that the 19th century was a state of courts and parties. A state of courts and parties. Um, regulation in 19th century America, in other words, was done first by courts and then as a last measure by parties and legislatures. Most regulation in the 19th century was the result of the application of common law principles at the state level. If somebody committed a nuisance, plaintiffs could recover damages by bringing common law suits. Courts could revoke licenses when recipients violated the terms on which the license was issued. Local judges often assessed taxes. They built roads. Um, they enforced prohibition regulations. The courts were actually the administrators in many of these cases. Uh, the judicial role in regulation was the first and most paramount role. That role, though, was supplemented by municipal ordinances issued by and enforced and administered by local officers. Um, people like justices of the peace, town selectmen, commissioners, assessors, constables, often they were elected democratically and they were given the power to issue regulations and the power to enforce them. Um, these administrative powers were local. The elections were um, very uh, accountable to the people, and therefore they accepted some blending of powers at the state and local levels in the 19th century. 
Um, the kinds of creative arrangements we had in the 19th century seem very foreign to our thinking, but I think it's critical to look carefully at those arrangements as we search for al alternatives to the administrative state. The benefit of this complicated division of regulatory power was observed by Alexis de Tocqueville, whose observations on administration, I think, are essential for understanding where we've come from. Um, summarizing the 19th century approach to regulation, Tocqueville said this, um, America divides the use of society's forces among several hands. In partitioning authority in this way, one renders its action less irresistible and less dangerous, but one does not destroy it, end of quote. It was easier in some ways um, to resist administrative power in the 19th century, but administrative power was less dangerous and yet it was still significant. Uh, in this kind of a system, Tocqueville explained, quote, authority is great and the official small, so that society would continue to be well regulated and remain free, end of quote. That authority was great, but official power was small. So the alternative to the modern administrative state is not to abolish all regulation or to eliminate every federal agency. And I think we're misguided when we advance those kinds of um, solutions. But to understand the alternative, it does require a serious and careful consideration of how regulation and administration used to work in America and how in many respects the modern administrative state threatens that tradition of constitutional administration. Anti-administrativism has a deep and proud tradition in American politics, a tradition that we should draw inspiration from as we continue to think about reforms that we want to advance in the present day. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. I want to open it up to questions from the audience in the back. Diane. Thank you so much for your comments. I'm Diane Katz from Heritage. Um, in respect to this idea of looking back at the 19th century, there's uh, defenders of the administrative state, like Vermeule, who say um, it's both inevitable and necessary to have the administrative state because of the power, primarily economic, although also political, of multinational other corporations that um, were really conceived of um, at the time of the, of the, you know, framers. And so I just wanted you to respond. Yeah, so the question of scale, I guess, that there's, you know, even not just nationalization of, of the economy, but globalization means that you can't govern these kinds of decisions unless you centralize power further and further. Um, I think that if that's true, and that is a question, um, whether it's true or not, but even if we accept the premise, that doesn't mean that these trends are happening in the same way with every single area of policy. For instance, let's take environmental law. Certainly many of the consequences and causes of environmental um, injury have become now much more centralized. I mean, think of, you know, obviously the debate over, over the climate is not a debate over what's going on in one small jurisdiction, but what's going on everywhere and what's causing it. But most environmental injuries really are sort of localized um, and can be dealt with then without worrying about how this affects people in other jurisdictions. So even if it's true that some decisions really have to be handled in a more centralized way, that doesn't mean that we turn all decisions over to centralized authorities. And again, I think the environmental context is one place in which we've completely abandoned the idea of using these kinds of local regulations. Um, to accomplish the ends that we all agree on or that most of us agree on. Um, when I teach environmental law, I, I like to bring up the case of the Aaron Brockovich story, um, in which you're sort of dealing with uh, a sort of local environmental problem without the use of a massive administrative apparatus, but simply through the private law, you know, sort of common law traditional mechanisms that we've used for a long time. So. One thing I think it's worth doing is for us to try to differentiate where the logic of the centralization thesis applies and where it doesn't, and then to try to push back in places where that logic doesn't apply. 
Todd Gatziano. Todd Gatziano from Pacific Legal Foundation. Joe, that was a wonderful talk, and I am sure your book is even more wonderful. My only regret is that C-SPAN wasn't here taping it uh, for Book TV, but we'll work on that. Oh. I'm, I'm convinced that, that part of the solution is having people like you uh, talk more uh, and get your book into the public. I just wanted you to elaborate on one point you uh, began with, and that was noting uh, Jillian Metzger's um, Harvard Law Review uh, critique of the um, uh, d uh, d uh, uh, the anti-administrative us, those of us who would proudly wear that label, and and here is my impression of her ar argument. Um, it was different in two respects than the similar progressive critiques of Gary Lawson and, and, and others in, in, in these ways. First of all, in her yes, introduction or, or abstract, I forget which, she m makes a claim, I think she's writing mostly to her fellow progressives, that the, it would be a mistake, she says, to dismiss the anti-administrative movement as one that will not make lasting impacts. Because in the past, and this is the second distinction, I think in the rest of her article, she does not dismiss us as kooks or, or fringe. The, the other critiques of the past 25 years, or even going back to the New Deal after there was some victory, was that we need to put these people down because they're kooks and fringe people. She seemed, her tone seemed, tell me if you agree, seemed to be a little bit more respectful. And she was saying, they're going to have some impact. We need to limit it because they just don't understand fully how wonderful the administrative state is. Do you agree? I think that's, a, that's certainly a fair reading of that article. She was very clear that um, these that people who are anti-administrativists should not be dismissed, and that there's al there are already voices on the Supreme Court, there are already voices in Congress who are saying a lot of the same things that the scholars and the academics are saying. Um, every once in a while in that article she said, well, you know, there's always a mismatch between the rhetoric that these people use and the actual results that they accomplish. But she was certainly not dismissive. Um, of the the danger that people of this persuasion presented. Um, I think my main concern with the article is that people of the anti-administrativist persuasion are, are portrayed as dangerous at all. Um, and this is a sort of, I think this is one of the deep intellectual blind spots of the pro-administrativists, I guess, um, if we're going to call them that is that they have this sense of sort of rational government and the only way government can work is through this sort of rational design and the messiness of politics where you have elections for people who have to make important decisions and they you know, might take money from people um, and all of these kinds of things, they just, they don't see any room for that in politics, which strikes me as a very narrow and limited understanding of what politics is. And that's why some of this history was so much fun because these were real people engaged in actual politics. They were having a debate and they were engaged in rhetoric and they had, uh, you know, they were willing to make compromises and bargain. And today the rhetoric seems to be much more Manichaean, black and white. This is the way things must be and if you disagree with that, then you're a threat. And I think that's, um, that's happening in a lot more places than just this debate. But I think that's the big, problem I had with the way she portrayed it. But you're absolutely right. She, she did not dismiss this new intellectual and judicial and political movement. Uh, in the front there and then behind. Uh, Randy May, Free State Foundation. Uh, Joe, as you know, I've read your book and I second Todd, it's, it's terrific. Uh, Terrific book, so I hope you sell all those that are stacked up out there. Uh, so you alluded uh, briefly to Scalia uh, in reference to the Chevron doctrine, and uh, as you said, he was a very strong defender of 
Chevron, you know, which uh, a, a lot of people that didn't follow his jurisprudence, you know, just intuitively, you know, sometimes assert otherwise. Um, and um, just as the other thing he was a strong defender of was the non-delegation. I mean, it, it took a very liberal view of non-delegation, so public interest was fine, fine with him. But my question is, late in his life, before his untimely death, he seemed to be rethinking Chevron, right, and a, and a couple of those decisions. And maybe you can, I, it's been a while since I've gone back and looked, but maybe you can, uh, uh, do you know anything about why he was doing that and what import you think that had? Because he seemed to be drawing away from his earlier strong defense of Chevron. Right. I think that's correct to say that Scalia's views on this were, to the extent we could discern them or observe them, they were shifting. The Perez um, case, the mortgage bankers case, which uh, I think was more about our deference, but he sort of raised certain objections or reservations that he had about the whole, the whole idea of deference to legal interpretations by agencies. So he was starting, it seemed like, to shift that way. As far as why that happened, I think there's, I don't know if anybody's really explored that fully. I think there's some really interesting story to be told there. Um, and it has a lot to do with looking at some of those regulation articles. Um, I think Scalia, was he the editor of the journal regulation? Or he published very frequently in that journal in the, I think, early 80s. And he wrote some interesting things there that grounded his Chevron um, defense that um, he thought history mandated judicial deference to executive interpretations of law. There were some 19th century cases that seemed to indicate that. Uh, and I think the scholarship debunked that over the last few years. I'm thinking in particular of a really great article by um, a University of Virginia law professor named Aditya Bamzai, um, where he shows that the deference to executive interpretations of law was really a deference to contemporaneous interpretations of law that the executive just happened to um, promulgate. And that um, the historical case for deference really just didn't work. And then once you read the Administrative Procedure Act, which says reviewing courts shall decide all relevant questions of law, and you remember that the judicial power is lodged in Article Three, it just seems like those arguments start to really stack up against deference. I think he was being persuaded of that, and I can only speculate on those things, but um, I think he was starting to come around to that way of thinking. Um, but describing that whole transition in his thought, I think, would be a really interesting thing to, to go through and to try to explain. Mark, Mark Chenoweth, New Civil Liberties Alliance. Uh, professor, uh, one of the things that the critics of the anti-administrativists seem to come back to again and again is Lochner, and they suggest that any of the sort of contemporaneous uh, concern with the administrative state is just uh, trying to overturn the New Deal by a return to the to the Lochner era. The, the quotes that you uh, that you shared from Roscoe Pound and and Woodrow Wilson and others would seem to refute that. But I wonder if if you might say more about uh, whether there's validity to that uh, return to Lochner thesis. Right. If the Lochner boogeyman, which gets trotted out, is just to stand in place of judges making important decisions that have legal ramifications, then um, yes, I suppose the alternative to the administrative state is a much more robust judicial uh, power. But if we understand Lochner more precisely than that and what it actually did, um, I think that Lochner itself was much more of an exception than the rule um, in terms of what courts were doing during that period. And I think in that we see an important historical illustration of what might happen today if we had a much more uh, robust role for courts. Not that the judges would just usurp everything and constantly be overturning administrative decisions over and over again, but that there would be some meaningful check that would enforce, um, that would require agencies to be much more fair and unbiased in their decision making. So. Um, just as the Lochner era court wasn't willy-nilly overturning every regulation that every state enacted, um, but rather exercised a reasonable and limited check on regulation, I think 
if we somehow didn't have, if somehow Chevron went away, it doesn't seem to me that courts would constantly be second guessing what the agencies are doing willy nilly. They would be very measured about doing that because they understand that the agencies do have some expertise that might require them to take seriously the agency's reasons. So um, it seems like the fear of Lochnerizing back at the time when everybody denounced Lochner um, was a little bit overwrought, and I think the same would hold today as well. David. Joe, what would the architects of the administrative state think of the administrative state today? Would they say, this is what we had in mind, it's great? Or would this be a case of, well, this is not what we had in mind. In theory, it was supposed to work out differently. This is a monstrosity. Mm -hmm. So the, I, by architects, I mean the good nows, the early progressives who defended the idea of moving power out of the political branches into the administrative state. Right. That's a really great question. I think they would be um, somewhat naively optimistic about the administrative state in spite of how badly, from their point of view, things have gone. Um, you can find, you know, there's the idea of capture theory, that once you lodge administrative power, or lo lodge this power in administrative agencies that are insulated from accountability, interests know exactly where to target their resources and the American people don't follow the administrative process and therefore it's a lot easier to actually get corporations can get their preferred policies done much more easily in the administrative state. People were voicing those concerns like in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Capture theory was a thing way back before it became an actual term. Um, and the perfect uh, illustration of how some progressives eventually realized that this was a problem, um, the, the illustration of this is James Landis, who one of the three or four people most responsible for laying out the theoretical case for administration, has a famous report to the president-elect in 1960, John F. Kennedy, where he says, well, the practice of administrative law has actually been the opposite of what we anticipated. Um, it's really inefficient. It's actually not efficient. Science is not driving these decisions. It's a bunch of interests that are doing it. And you would think that he would have inferred from that that the project needed to be seriously rethought. But if you read the report carefully, he says, no, we can fix this by just adding more administrative law. Um, if we just set everything up just right and we learn from our mistakes, we'll fix the administrative state. So he sort of always maintained this optimism that it was going to work out. My sense is that most progressives today, or most pro-administrativists today, would take the same view, that there's all kinds of bad things happening in the administrative state. It's corrupt in various ways. But if we just purify it even more than we have, then we'll finally get what we want. Um, that, I think, betrays a lack of historical understanding that um, I think those of us who are maybe a little more skeptical of administration need to be constantly reminding them that history points in the opposite direction. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Wayne Proud with Freedom Works. I just had a, you know, it's very interesting to, the tension between the agencies and the courts. I just was wondering your thoughts on, on the RAINS Act and whether Congress reinserting itself into the process is a good thing. And do you think that will be a, would be a positive reform over the long run? Um, yes. Uh, the RAINS Act, which would basically say Congress has to enact major rules, um, which meet this sort of economic threshold of 100 million uh, per year of annual economic impact. Um, I think we could talk about the scope of it and sort of, you know, uh, different aspects of the law, which we might, you know, disagree about some of the particulars. But the general idea, which is that Congress should be enacting law, is just so commonsensical that it's hard to see how people disagree with it. And there are two really interesting people who have endorsed the RAINS Act, or the idea of the RAINS Act. The first was James Landis, who right in the middle of the New Deal, in the middle of the 1930s, said, we should probably have agencies sending their rules over to Congress for up or down votes. And the other one is Stephen Breyer, who has actually endorsed. Um, and again, not people that we would expect to be hard anti-administrativists think that this is 
probably a good idea in the American system that laws enacted by elected representatives. Um, the Congressional Review Act and its recent uh, sort of resurgence of use is, I think, very positive because it's shown that Congress can be held responsible when it's willing to take responsibility and we can look and see who's responsible for these decisions and we have some electoral control over them. So um, I think it's one of the fundamental uh, principles of our system. The RAINS Act, I think, seeks to, to try to bring us back to that principle. I have time for one more question. All right, pressure's on. I'll try to make it good. Uh, Bryce Chenault with the GW Regulatory Studies Center. Uh, Thank you for your presentation. Enjoyed this very much. I, I also I enjoyed when you were talking about de Tocqueville and some of the 18th century observations about where authority is great but official power is small. And I was wondering, are there any 21st century examples of that we could point to that were the administrative state is functioning well, and that maybe could be emulated elsewhere? Something that we could build off of. Um, if we think about the policies. I think it's important to keep the policies enacted by the administrative state versus the structural crisis that it presents. I think it's important to keep those separate. I think you could make the, clay, the case, and it's hard to identify causality here, but you could make the case that environmental regulation in this country has been a resounding success. Um, the Clean Air Act, uh, the, the, you know, the pollutants identified in the Clean Air Act have been dramatically diminished since the, the law was passed. Now, you can debate over what the cause of cleaning the air was. Was it the Clean Air Act or was it, you know, um, technological advances and what's the relationship there? But I think many of the objectives that the administrative state is designed to promote, many of the ends are perfectly reasonable, legitimate ends. Workplace safety, pure food and drug, um, those things are, are reasonable ends. They're good ends. Um, the difficulty is when you set up enormous arbitrary, potentially arbitrary power in order to attain those ends. And so I think there have been some successes of the administrative state on a, as a policy matter, but at what cost to the sort of structural integrity of our political system? Those, those questions, are it's harder to measure the damage it's done to the structure of the system um, and so that's why I think we should be increasingly intent attentive to those costs. Listen, thank you all for coming and thank you for your questions. Please join me in thanking our guests. <laughs>